Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Polyhedron Collider Cast, episode 31. I'm Steve Tudor from Polyhedron Collider. I'm John Cage. And I'm not John Cage. But who are you? I'm Andy. People should know that by now. Well, it might be their first time listening. That's true. I'm Andy, clearly the best one of the group. The other two are just, you know, there to fill the space. Well, I mean, that is open to debate somewhat. That's true. To be fair, Mr Cage, you do fill less space than the rest of us, don't you? Uh, that is a science <laughs> fact. I can't deny that. <laughs> <laughs> Volumetrically speaking, you are inferior. Well, inferior is a very derogatory term, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Reality is a very poor approximation to theory. Mm. Anyway... Anyway, so those of you that are regular listeners, I first have to offer an apology because it's been about four weeks since we last recorded. It has been some time, hasn't it? Yeah, yes. considering at one point I was planning on doing you know the second and fourth Sunday of every month, um, that's completely gone by the wayside due to holidays, work, and everyone wanted to try and play D&D. Mm. I distinctly remember pointing out that setting that time scale would set you up for a fall, Mr. Tudor. You did. Fair dues, you did. Oh, we did. You were yes. correct. Yes. I usually am. <laughs> well, Again, open to debate. <laughs> that's very much open to debate that one. That definitely not is science fact, that one. <laughs> it was said by a scientist. It must be a fact. Still, we've been away for a while, but we are back again now. So let's start with a bit of wreck and ruin. Mm. Okay, then, if you insist. I've seen some pictures from you guys, and it looked quite intriguing. So you guys played it last weekend, right? We did. We did. And you enjoyed it? We very much did. It's all right, I suppose. Past the time. (laughs) (laughs) Andy, did you just like it because you won the game? Um, no. It was a lot of fun, actually. I mean, winning Mm. helps, obviously, but um, because I'm a dreadful winner. But no, it's, it, it is a, a lot of fun, actually. In fact, didn't we get shouted at by Amanda for making for having too much fun? We did, actually, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good sign. Because we were, we were laughing that much. Amanda was upstairs and can we get the hell you two laughing at? But we're having fun. Oh, okay, <laughs> oh, fair enough. You could, you could hear the jealousy in her tone. We stopped the tickling <laughs> thing. We're just playing board games now. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you in your pants, Andy? It's comfy. <laughs> not the dinner table Andy no <laughs> so what makes it a good game so Wreck and Ruin is basically Mad Max board game is the best mm. way to think about it okay. pretty much so you have a repertoire of vehicles ranging from scouts on motorbikes to the big rig nice. which <laughs> is what, what you'll see in most of the photographs um, there's also like a jeep and the wrecker which was uh, like a jeep, like an armoured jeep with a battering ram attached to the front. Mm, a Land Rover Discovery with a stick on the front. Yeah, I saw the pictures of that one, and I did question what exactly you guys were up to, because there is a certain... Um... Bulbousness, shall we say? Fa- yes, Phallic exactly. quality. Phallic quality, that's what I was actually going to say. <laughs> but yes, it was a bit bulgy at the front. It is. It's the penis truck. <laughs> Just make sure you don't get rear-ended by the penis truck. <laughs> Yeah, you don't want the penis truck in your big rig. No, you do <laughs> You do not. In fact, Steve was rear-ended by my penis truck. Was he indeed? Mm. He did not come off well. No, yeah. that was very bad, actually. It wrecked you, in fact. <laughs> it, did, it left you it? burning and sore. <laughs> oh, oh, at least we've got our explicit rating right from the start. We're making no pretense there's been a family show, are we? We haven't uh, sworn yet. We've just relied on people's active imaginations. <laughs> uh, what do you actually do in the game? How, how, do you, how do you win? So the idea is you're in the kind of like post-apocalyptic wasteland and you score points by capturing objectives, which are supposed to be uh, sites of... Scientific interest? Ancient technology. Yeah, science of <laughs> it's, interest. It's, 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 <laughs> nature reserves, you know? Areas of special natural beauty. In a post-apocalyptic future, I suppose they would be. They're mm. just not designated by a little blue plaque, you know? <laughs> you think areas of outstanding natural beauty would be few and far between if it really is a desert wasteland. I guess that's what makes them so special. Indeed, there were quite a few of them, though. So the idea of the game is there are four of these on the board at any one time, and all you have to do is drive up to one, park on top of it, and wait. Okay. Simple enough. 
It's simple enough and sounds really boring. <laughs> like you yes. making a really fun game there, Steve, and making it about as exciting as an accountancy seminar. <laughs> so is it sort of capture the flag almost then? That sort of. Although the flags you... disappear. But yeah, what's the um what domination is it they call it? Yeah. And most first person shooters now where you have a target area, you gotta stand on it, capture it, and then another one will appear yeah, okay. somewhere else on the map. So it's kinda of like that. So if you get damaged while you're sitting on top of this or you get knocked off it, then you lose a chance. You basically go hold on to the point for a complete turn. Mm-hmm. And that's basically where the fun turns up, because what you do is you go hell for leather, full throttle, to get to the, the, the objective. You sit on top of it, stick the handbrake on, and then... Eat your sandwiches. Everyone comes out of nowhere and shoots at you and rams you and does everything they can to knock you off this thing. Pretty much. I could see why that would be entertaining. <laughs> oh, it certainly was, yes. The best bit is, though, is because you've only got... A, you've got it for, what, five units, so two, two of these little wee scouts, um, a jeep, the, buggy. The, pe- the penis truck, and uh, the big rig... <laughs> And obviously you're trying to go for other things. It's obviously a nice balance between trying to knock your opponent off the objective that they might have snaffled and obviously trying to move your resource to try and go and get something else as well. Every unit has its own stats. So each the scouts can move really quickly but have bugger all armor and no firepower. Whereas the big rig is very, very hard, has lots of firepower, but moves like it's driving through molasses. So it's obviously a, a nice balance between them. Oh yeah, it's 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 definitely mm. thematic, representative, and it, it make it all makes sense. It's also quite interesting. You've got five activations as well. Yes. So you've got five action points you can do, but to move a unit is an action point, but to shoot is also an action point. Right. So you, you've got five units and five actions. So you could manoeuvre everything in a turn, but if you want to shoot at someone, which you're going to want to do, then someone's not moving. Yeah, okay, so it's another one of these games where you there's lots and lots of options that you can do, but you can only do a subset of them. Yes. And now you've yeah. got to work out which subset means you get to ram your penis truck into the enemy. <laughs> Indeed, and that is why it's fun, not necessarily ramming your penis truck into the enemy, but not having <laughs> enough actions to do what you want. It sounds like an interesting challenge. On top of that, uh, once you actually manage to capture one of these sites, uh, you get salvage, which you can use to your advantage. And what sorts of things does salvage it's, constitute? It basically gives you special actions or special abilities, but you can only they're only one shot. Um, yeah. So I had a couple of really entertaining ones, much to Steve's consternation. Well, we both had entertaining ones because I had um, I had like heat seeking missiles. So for like one fire, I did rolled loads of dice. Off go the blue shells. <laughs> yeah, and he had one which is basically the turbo boost from Knight Rider. Yeah, that's <laughs> brilliant. brilliant. <laughs> so he basically jumped over one of my other vehicles, which was hilarious. That was great. Um, oh, what was the one where you really screwed me over? Oh, that was it. There was one where you took a control of one of my vehicles. Wasn't it like you hacked one of yeah. my vehicles? So I said, yeah. I'm going to activate this. And it happened to be on the Scouts, which is the fastest moving vehicles. And he suddenly went, right, you're going to move where I want you to. Dilly, 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 dilly. Off you go. <laughs> oh, is that you on the end of the map, Steve? Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> and at this point, he managed to manoeuvre his big rig in between the ro- rock and the edge of the board. <laughs> Remember that scene from Austin Powers where he's turning the cart in that corridor <laughs> and doing like a million point turn? That was Steve's big rig. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. I had to do it, otherwise I would have given Andy another objective. <laughs> mm. That, well, that does sound funny. like reason not to. <laughs> mm. Oh, indeed. One other thing that's really cool about this is when you do destroy an enemy vehicle, and you do destroy them a lot, um, they basically just... They, it's called wrecking, I think it is. Yes. Um, so you roll a direct dice to see what direction they go in, and then roll a dice to see how far they go. Right. So every time something gets like seriously damaged, it can cause this like knock-on effect where it goes careering off the board, <laughs> hits something else, rams that. That causes damage, which causes that to go careering off the board in another direction. It's a lot of fun. I like it when you have those sort of um, chaotic little elements, that, especially when they cascade. <laughs> mm. Yes. <laughs> it happened a couple of times. You're like, blammo, yes, I've killed you! Shit, this could go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I did not think think about where that was no. going to end up going. And he's hit him, and oh my god! <laughs> pretty pretty much, yeah. It was great. Didn't you shoot one of my bikes? My bike hit you and knocked you off the board, or something daft like that at one yes, point. Yes, it... I think you knocked me backwards, <laughs> which was inconvenient. <laughs> 
it does sound like there's a few uh, kind of parallels between this and um, Robo Rally. It's definitely got the silliness and the the chaos in it, but with uh, less programming. It, <laughs> well, it's no, it's no programming because it's exactly. just a, it's, you know you just you do take an action and off you go. Yeah, I would say as well the game is rules wise is really quite straightforward. And it's one of those things, I mean, because we, we did we missed this out on this at the UK Games Expo, so I'm, I was looking for the rules and thinking, mm, this looks a bit... Mm, sort of like a hundred other games I've played kind of thing. You know, two sides move around and shoot each other. Mm. But because it's so fast, because the movement's so big, the way the steering works, you, you can't just, like, you know, do a 180-degree turn or whatever. You've got to think about how you, you, you move through these hexes mm. and this chaos that ensues when things wreck and burn. <laughs> it's just it was just simply fun, wasn't it? I mean it was Yeah. It was. It was it was highly entertaining. It's the best way to put it, it really was. On the pictures I saw there were um loads of little flames, it looks like you'd stuck on top of the, the, the vehicles. Did they have a significance or was that just that one's out of control now or something? Um it's the damage. So instead of Putting little tokens ah. next to each tri- each there's there isn't a card or anything to it for each vehicle. You get a summary card which describes you know all the stats for each vehicle and one thing, a little table. But the way you you indicate damage on the vehicle is you put a little orange flame on the vehicle because each vehicle can take a certain amount of damage and it all it's all different. So there's little holes on each miniature. So you put a little flame into one of these holes to represent a hit point, and then the very final one uh, is a black flame. Which represents it's a wreck, so it's it's basically humped. At which point, you know, you basically that's when the careering goes out of control and the the vehicles temporarily out of the game. You can repair them if you spend an action mm. point, so you can bring your vehicle back in the game. So you're not completely out unless it goes off the map, at which case you've got to start at your start point again. So nothing dies permanently, but it's quite expensive to bring it back into the game. Okay, I like that. I like the that little touch that the actual damage is on the board so you can see it more visibly. That's quite cool. Yeah, it worked really well because, as as, you, as you've, you've alluded to there, at a glance you can basically tell how what kind of state your opponent's in without sort of leaning over the board and looking at hit point trackers and all this sort of jazz. You just look at the vehicles and go, well, that one's fucked. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys play it, played it with two. Did you play it with more players? Four players were available in the box. Okay. Mm. And it's just a shame I've not had a chance to play it with more players because I think that would be even more chaotic. Yeah, that's oh, what yes, I was about to say. So. <laughs> and probably um, slightly more balanced. Yes. It's... We did think there was, there was a slight balance issue with two players because we found that whoever went first um, got a bit of an advantage on the first round. Okay. Mm. Um, just because they could get to a point where they could hold objectives, but the other player couldn't contest them quick enough. Right. Mm. So basically, I, I went first and bundled for these two um, salvage things, um, and I got to two of them, which meant Steve was automatically on the back foot and had to make a decision as to whether bundle for me, sacrifice the two nearest him, um, and try and get me off the ones I'd got, or just bundle for them and see what happened. Yeah, okay. There, yeah. ought, there ought to be some balance, like you can only do half as many moves or something, perhaps. Yeah, they just needed something for the first player to just be slightly less advantaged. Now, I've already spoken to Mark, who's the designer, and he said he's already going to think of a couple of ways to get around that. Mm-hmm. Which is good. Mm. Does sound pretty cool. Yeah, it really was. I think it's fair yeah. to say that's the only negative thing we can think about about the game. And it sounds like it's going to be fixed anyway. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> do we have a, a price for it we don't have a price yet it's hitting kickstarter on the 3rd of october and i don't know i mean there's four factions in the game and i can get the impression based on the description of the factions that we should get four different types of vehicles At the moment i think I, I get the feeling they might be stretch goals because i've only ever seen pictures of the main faction which we were playing with mm, on yeah. the on saturday Okay. All the miniatures were the same, they were just different colours. Yeah. So I don't know price yet, but 3rd of October it'll be hitting Kickstarter, so it's not too far away. Mm. I will keep my eyes peeled for that one. Yeah, it was good. And I think I'm pretty sure at least one of us will be backing it. I wouldn't like to um, specify as to who. <laughs> but we all know what the answer is. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Has Andy got money? Then it's Andy. 
<laughs> no, it, it it really was a lot of fun, to be fair. So that's Wreck and Ruin. Mm-hmm. I said that'll be hitting Kickstarter uh, the 3rd of October. Nice. Speaking of Kickstarters that Mr. Lewis has backed... <laughs> <laughs> which, there are, which there are many. Because that is a, a narrow category. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I had an opportunity this weekend to play this War of Mine with Andy. You did, because I almost insisted upon it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we were torn between playing that and Star Wars Rebellion again, and we realised we really didn't have enough time for Star Wars Rebellion. And in all honesty, we didn't have enough time for this War of Mine either. But we got a damn good taste of it, I thought. Oh, we did have enough time, because we lost heavily. Mm, yeah, and we decided. had one person who was hanging yeah. on by his fingernails. <laughs> Should we call it, Steve? Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, let's call it. So this War of Mine, that's co-op, right? Yes. Kind of. Kind, kind of. of. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. What did Andy do? But, no, no, no. Very quickly, we have mentioned this in the previous podcast. Yeah. Andy took us through it. It's a board game conversion of the video game. Um, and it is an incredibly faithful adaption of the video game. It really is. Um, al- almost to a fault. Yeah. I was going to say, it, it, it covers... I would say almost everything that's in the video game, apart from the way in which it does the raids. Mm. So you're shacked up in a house in the middle of a war zone, and overnight you can go and do raids in order to get like new re- more resources. So whereas the video game actually has you controlling the character moving through a house, this it abstracts it a bit, so you go through a deck of cards and reveal events. Okay, mm. it's quite a good mechanic actually. I think it's quite it's quite yeah. good. It's very tense. Oh, yeah. God, it's very tense, yeah. Although, to be honest, I think it's actually harder than the computer game. It's a lot less forgiving. I'd agree, actually, yeah. It's... Why do you think that is, then? Things go wrong quicker, or...? Yes, you get attacked more, you get less stuff for the time you spend searching. It kind of makes up... The game kind of makes up for it by saying, at the end of your scavenging run, you can basically bring back as much wood, water, and... Um, components uh, components as you can carry i mean there's a weight limit to each character so that you, you can't bring back as much as you as you want mm-hmm. which is quite a nice addition but amongst all of that you'll get things like mechanical parts weapons food all of these have weight so you've got to make a, a genuine decision at the end of the scavenging what to bring back although invariably you won't have what you went out for <laughs> yes <laughs> we went out for something like a shitload of food because without it we were just going to starve to death and we ended up bringing back four cigarettes two shotgun shells and a knife <laughs> and three stuffed flamingos <laughs> mm, and the partridge in the pear tree <laughs> but no food but no food so yeah the reason why we said it's almost perfect rendition to a fault is I kind of left the game I enjoyed it I thought it was a very good game. I thought it was very well done. Although, I don't know why I would play this over playing the video game. Yeah, I, it's, I can't disagree with you there, Steve, because I think, I mean, having played it now with, you know, two and one and more, it definitely works better with one. It is a solo game. It's a solo game, yeah. And at which point, if you're going to do a solo game, which is a ver- copy of a video game... Why bother? Play the video Why? game. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you don't play video games, play the board game, and it works really, yes. really well. That is an argument that's been levied against your comments on Twitter. Yes. <laughs> and it's a valid point. The issue with it is, it is a lot more faffy than I think it needs to be. Steve pointed out to me once we'd finished playing, he says, why do we have all of these tokens to represent the states of the people? You just have a, cra- a character board. That's a good point, Steve. I'd not thought of that. And it would, there's a lot, there's so much of the game that is just spent rifling through the box, picking out the right tokens. It does take a long, a, a large amount of time to actually do that. It's weird, the, um, like you were saying before, we picked up cigarettes, shotgun shells and things like that. I kind of thought they've, they've gone for a full-on replication of the video game. Mm. So you've got all these different items in there. And I kind of thought, well, that means that every time I've got to pill a cigarette out, as you said, I've got to rifle through the box and find a cigarette token. And it just felt, as you said, faffy. Why well, I felt it could have just been streamlined a little bit. Yeah, it does sound like quite hard work, like unnecessarily hard work. Yeah, a little bit. And I say it works, and it is a really good recreation of the computer game. But it, I think, it, yeah, a little bit more thought on the the faff side of things would have been better. Could have taken some shortcuts for the players there. Yeah, yeah. the big thing for me though is there was no cooperative game mechanics in it. There is one, but I took it out. 
<laughs> Which, this is this is the one about you take turns controlling all the actions. Basically, yeah. There's a, a yeah. massive like block capitals. I swear in the rule book that says only the person holding the book of scripts may touch the cut the, the game components. <laughs> it's like what? What kind of fascist board game is this? But it's, it's basically what's supposed to happen is every time you go through a stage of the game, you pass the book of scripts, which is like this massive book that tells. It's basically the the the. Um, choose your own adventure style of things where there's numbered paragraphs in it and they all explain what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and you pass this book to the next player and then you'll do something and you pass the book on and then you pass the book on. So the idea being that everyone kind of gets a go to move the stuff around the board. But given that it's a cooperative game and you're all in it together, it kind of just, to me, just felt a little bit dumb. It felt like it was forced. Yeah, exactly. Because in every, in every other cooperative game you have... You have a character which is your character. Mm. Even in the example um, Dead of Winter, which thematically this is probably the closest game to Dead of Winter. There's a yeah. lot of similarities. You're stuck in a building. You're going out to raid to get items. There you've got a. You're probably of going to die when you do it. Yeah, I'm probably going to die very quickly. Yes, due to starvation and lack of morale and snipers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but in those ones, okay, you're working as a team. And you know you you've got a team objective. You want to win between you, but you're still in control of your actions. You've still got this thing which is yours, which you own. Yeah. Mm. Which means you feel in control. This game was like you will have three characters and three characters only. Yeah, it's like as the players, you aren't playing as the characters in the game. You're playing as the management committee that that kind of organizes them. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. yeah. It just if if it been like we take a character each. And there'd been a way to scale the game for one, two, three, four, mm. five players or whatever, it would have felt natural to me. And I can choose where my character goes and roll the dice when my character takes the actions. But it wasn't. It was like these three characters are shared between the entire group. Yeah, yeah that does sound slightly weird. Three. Always three. <laughs> you can three. get a fourth. Because if somebody turns up and they join the group, but um, the ch- I've, I've never got to that point. Um, usually when somebody turns up, it's because two of them have been shot or died <laughs> or you're basically forced into the position where you need at least two characters or you're going to lose because the game is that uh, uh, that harsh and severe and against you. It's horrible. It's really good, but it's so brutal. Three shall be the number of the counting. The number of the counting <laughs> shall, be shall be three. Five is right out. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds like it. That would frustrate me. I think it frustrated me. It definitely did. It's like I said, everything else about it worked perfectly and conveyed the video game brilliantly. It was just, it's like as if someone hadn't made that one extra step to turn it into a board game. Mm. Mm. But I'd still play it again. Yeah, yeah. I'd I really have like to it, play. But... I'd have to play something more cheerful either before or afterwards. <laughs> yes. But, <laughs> yeah. Just God, just imagine playing the after, playing in the afternoon, playing Dead of Winter, and then this War of Mine. God, you'd want to shoot yourself afterwards, <laughs> <laughs> and then finish it off with a nice, relaxing game of Pandemic Legacy. <laughs> oh God, yeah. <laughs> there would not be a man left alive in that room afterwards. <laughs> yeah, it's that's... when you're considering like watching The Shining or It to cheer yourself up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it really is miserable, and 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 I think Awaken Realms have done a really good job in capturing that spirit. They really have. It's very tense mm. and very miserable, which is which is they are to be commended for doing such a thing. But yeah, that was good. So I'm glad you've played it now, Steve, so you can understand yeah. what I'm rabbiting about. Mm. <laughs> so that's this war of mine. So another Kickstarter we want to quickly mention is the Champion of the Wild, which um, it's the 13th today. That should hit Kickstarter on the 18th of this month. That's 18th of September. Now, this is a game I got both of you to... Tr- well, tried to get both of you to play, but you weren't having it. Is this the one where I told you in no categor- in, in categorical terms to fuck off because it sounded terrible? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, just describe for the listeners what this one involved. I mean, hypothetically <laughs> speaking, I couldn't remember which game this was. <laughs> Hypothetical, of course. Hypothetically, for the, yeah. For the listener only, for the listener's benefit. Yeah, imagine so, the listeners are a little both clueless. both of them? <laughs> <laughs> imagine the listeners are clueless and one of them's me. <laughs> so this is basically the Animal Olympics. So, ah, yes. And that is why I told Steve to fuck off. <laughs> so... Three players will select events. They'll be given a um, handful of cards with different events on them, and they must select which events they want to put forward. 
And these can be anything from Olympic events like, you know, 100 meter sprint hurdles, um, synchronized swimming, things like that. And then there are some other kind of games and events in there, such as uh, there's Winter Olympic stuff like Four Man Bobsled was in there. Uh, you also had some games like Hide and Seek. Imagine in a, a state giraffe home. doing a bobsled. <laughs> Or hide and seek, for that matter. <laughs> Indeed, and can zebras do synchronized swimming? That would and be a that, sight to behold. That laughing you're doing now is the whole point of the game. Is because somebody will put three events get put forward, and you have to choose one animal from your hand to enter into all three events. <laughs> oh, I see. And then you have to describe to the other players why your animal is going to win all three events. <laughs> So it's like a blagging contest. It's a blagging contest, yes. Now you see, now I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> so who who uh, who decides? Like, if you're all just persuading the other people, everyone gets uh, little medals, first, second, and third, what have you, and they dish out those to all the other animals. So for each event, you'll decide who which animals first, second, third, and at the end of the round, you tot up and score the points. Okay. That's so it. Do you do that secretly, or? Yeah, you've got these little tokens. You put a face down. Yeah. Okay. So you just give tokens to other players, flip them all over, and see how many points you've got, basically. Gotcha. Yeah. And there's three rounds, and then that's it. Yeah, three rounds. That's it. It's, it if you play the game as it's written, is it, it's quite short mm. because you'll just do three events. Now, uh, I played it with my parents and my in-laws and my sister, and we played it so that everyone had a chance of picking events. Because when you pick events as well, you're also the adjudicator. So if someone asks a question about, well, why would that happen? You get to decide the rules of your event. Right. So you don't take part in the event you choose? Uh, you, you do, but you can't vote for yourself when you okay. dish out medals. Well, that, makes, that makes sense, right, okay. Yeah, you can't vote for your own entry. So, the most, of course, the interesting bit is trying to describe why these things would happen. So, you know, a cheetah in a 100-metre sprint is pretty obvious, but trying to explain why hippos are good at synchronised swimming... <laughs> <laughs> hippos are very good swimmers, actually. Well, exactly, yeah. Well, my personal favourite from the evening was uh, the horse who was doing hide-and-seek in a stately home, who would do so by standing in front of the oil paintings. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's a fun fact, speaking of hippos. Did you know more people die in Africa from hippo attacks than they do from lions? No, I did not know that. Well, you do now, because hippos are vicious bastards, apparently, and they can shift when they want to. Is this just because people keep transporting white bowling balls through uh, hippo terrain? <laughs> are they hungry, uh, by chance? Uh, I see what you've done there. <laughs> yeah, he's clever there. And anyone under the age of about 34 will probably not know what that means. <laughs> oh, you can still get hungry, hungry hippos, can't you? I don't know. It was quite good fun. You know, I'm sure you can still eight. find it. Oh, it must exist somewhere. So yeah, it's quite silly little fun, really. Um, as you, as as when I just, you know, the problem with this game is, as you said earlier, I suggested it to you and you went no. Yes. Uh, but once you get going, it, as you said, it's a blagging contest. It's you coming up with stupid ideas as to why your animals are going to win the competition. That sounds kind of fun. Yeah. It's one of those games that's going to depend what the group is. It's probably a good one yeah. to bring out at Christmas, I would think. Yeah, after a couple of uh, after a couple of drinks, I think. I was about to say, yeah, it would probably be better after everyone's uh, lubricated and uh, a little more imaginative and open yes. to uh, suggestion. Does it not run the risk of getting a bit boring quite quickly, though? Well, as I said, we played it so that everyone had a chance of picking events. Mm. Which means they had a chance of adjudicating, and we found we played it. How about well, there's five of us, so we played five oh. rounds rather than like three kind of thing. Mm. No, 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 no. We played it. F no, we played three times. Sorry, so we effectively played three games back to back. Okay, and that was about right. So yeah, people do have that problem with party games where it feels like they play it too often. I think you're going to have this problem with this as well. Right. I mean, the deck of events was quite a big deck of events. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, you're going to have, every so often, you're going to have events coming around again. And if someone remembers, oh, yeah, someone came up with a fantastic idea why this animal should win, then, yeah, you might find it. Mm, it's more the the feel of it. 
Because, I mean, I use Obama Llama as an example. I did, we haven't gone through the entire deck of Obama Llama's cards before, but I just got bored of the idea. It just got tedious. Mm, yeah. That's all. Maybe just because I'm a miserable bastard, I don't know. I think maybe part of that, though, in Obama Llama, it's slightly more long-winded, whereas it sounds like Green. this is a bit more quick-fire. So I suspect mm. you might get bored of this one. It might take longer to get bored of this one. That's probably fair, especially after a few beers. Mm. You won't remember, you won't remember any, anything after a few beers. Well, I won't. Yeah. So that's Champion of the Wild. Um, quite liked it. It's mm. on Kickstarter on the 18th of September, so about now. Mm. Give a price for that one. Again, no. No, yeah, okay. <laughs> You're have to wait till the Kickstarter comes out. It's not going to be expensive, I don't think, because it is really is two decks of cards. Yeah. Uh, a deck of cards for the animals and a, and a deck of cards for the event, so... We're looking about a tenner then, I'd reckon. Fifteen, maybe. I reckon fifteen to twenty tops. Yeah. But I don't want—I don't want to go too much out on a limb there because we don't know yet. Let's wait and see. Yeah. Very quickly, then I think we should talk about Drinking Quest. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> which is a quest we are usually on. <laughs> see, that sounds like a good idea. It's like, it right, is, lads, it? let's go to the pub. But we're going to dress up in sh- swords and shields just for shits and giggles. That sounds fun. <laughs> maybe that's what I missed when I tried playing this game. This so, does not fill me with, with hope. <laughs> yeah, so I, I've i had this game for a while now, and it took me quite some time to play it. I really like the idea. Like, uh, Well, I like drinking games, so you know, it's, it sounded like it was going to be a winner. Uh, and I happened to try and play it in a Brewdog pub, which, again, seems like it could be a winner. Although, in retrospect, you probably don't want to play this game in a pub with really nice beers. You probably want to play it in a pub with some fairly generic bland beers because... Uh, and light beers. <laughs> yeah. So I, I like a good strong drinking game where it's fairly inevitable that you're going to get absolutely trashed. But I do like the games to go on a little bit and I do like them to have at least some element of skill. <laughs> and unfortunately, I kind of feel like Drinking Quest missed on... Well, All it, of it? Definitely, yeah. It, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so... um. <laughs> So basically, there's like uh, four piles of quest cards. You each get a character, and they've got some abilities and things, and you take it in turns to work your way through all these quests, and each one will have a challenge like an event or a a character, uh, a baddie that you have to defeat. And to defeat them, you basically take it in turns rolling dice, and whoever reaches zero hit points first dies. So if you defeat the monster, you get some loot, and if you lose, you down your drink. Whoa! So... Basically, you're pretty much guaranteed. That there's four piles of quests. You're pretty much guaranteed to down four drinks. After you've down that first one, they're then quite kind, and you don't have to down any more drinks until the next quest. <laughs> you just take three fingers instead. <laughs> oh, oh, well, that's fine then. But the problem that for can me, get messy. I mean, I don't mind. Like, okay, fine, downing four pints. It's not particularly nice, but for a novelty one-off sort of thing, I could. You, uh, you, yeah, it could be fun. The problem for me is that you're just rolling dice, so there's almost zero skill in any of this. And you're, Almost? Well... <laughs> Categorically zero skill. You can kind of upgrade your character, but then it's a, it's a very simple mechanic to do it. Like, if you've got enough money, you upgrade it, and there's really only one path to do it. How do you get money just from the quest? Yeah, when you defeat the monsters, you know, if you randomly roll the dice, okay. <laughs> This sounds like betrayal at House on the Hill with beer. <laughs> yeah. So I just yeah, <laughs> I I don't like I don't like the fact that there's basically no skill, and I don't like the fact that you're guaranteed everyone's guaranteed pretty much to down four pints. Like it's not even like a uh, one person's going to get shat on. So you everyone can kind of go, ha ha, you're the one that lost, ha ha, because everyone's lost in exactly the same quantities. <laughs> <laughs> so all in all. I was disappointed by it. I played a bit of it with you a couple of weekends back, and it was barely a game. Yeah. I did contact the manufacturer, uh, the design, sorry, and um, because some of the rules just seem like, basically, as soon as you pick this card, you're stuffed. You're, gonna, you're definitely guaranteed to drown your drink. It's not just a matter of time until you roll the wrong dice. <laughs> it deliberately screws one person over. And if there was fewer options to just down your drink every time... And those kind of once in a once in a quest kind of cards came up, so one person got screwed. I actually think it would be a more enjoyable game. 
just because you could take the piss out of someone for losing. <laughs> it was, as you said, there was no skill, but it was barely a game. You drew a card, it either had a monster on it, so you rolled your attack to try and beat the monster, or it had an event on it, and you rolled your dice to beat the event. Yeah. There was no decisions at any point. You just picked the cards, rolled some dice, applied the effect. Yeah. <sighs> that sounds pretty gash. So, like I said, I'm personally not a fan of drinking games. I don't see the point, because I've <clears> never really had a problem in getting myself drunk. <laughs> I've got very, very good at that over the years. That's true. But sometimes it's uh, it's fun to punish people. I don't need drinking to do that. <laughs> That's also a fair point. <laughs> turn up and talk at them. Bottom line is, um, yeah, thumb, thumbs down for that one. Not a fan. Sorry, I think it, it, you said it was coming out for another round of... Um, I, yeah, I think like a, I think what we played was the second edition mm-hmm. or the second uh, quest set. Uh, and I think the third quest set is, is hitting Kickstarter soon. Fair enough. Now, it did have a sexy Cthulhu in it. Yeah, actually, to be fair, the one redeeming feature of that game is that it there were some quite funny cards. So there's like a beer holder yeah. uh, enemy and uh, yeah, sexy Cthulhu and, and a bunch of other stuff that was reasonably entertaining. But I think once you've got over you know, some quite interesting, quite funny puns, that's kind of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not fans here then. So that's Drinking Quest. I don't think we were best pleased with that no not a fans no so normally at this time of the podcast we'd kind of open the floor to questions that people have sent us via twitter and facebook and whatever else but i wanted today to do a little something a little bit different and make something a little bit more focused because over the last few weeks there's been a few i think controversies Mm. over board game reviews and these things tend to go in cycles and these things kind of rear their ugly head every four to six months and me and Andy have been discussing it quite a bit over Facebook chat during the day so I thought it was something we should talk about purely on our lunch hours you know let less people yeah. you know accuse of being work shy yeah <laughs> just, just, oh, just lunch time <clears throat> <laughs> I come back to learn uh, to lunch and discover like 50 messages on that podcast chat <laughs> we, we just take lunch at <laughs> a different busted. time John that's what it is oh right okay <laughs> yeah Flexible working hours. <laughs> I stretch my lunch hour over the day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, we we did actually open up the questions to this. So we did ask for people to ask. We did get people to ask us questions regarding uh, reviews and reviewers. What we're going to try and do is we might not specifically ask everyone's question because we did get sent a lot. You know, normally we get sent three or four questions. I got I think we got sent about forty questions <laughs> over this. Uh, Most of them by Bez, I should point yeah. out. Mm. We're good. But we're we, not were you that bored, good. Bez? <laughs> <laughs> Bloody hell. It's a full page of them. We hope to address everyone's questions, but we might not call you up by name and said you asked that. So I apologise if I've missed you off, but we have had a hell of a lot. I'm going to say where I wanted to start this off is because the main topic point is really ethics in reviewing, and this seems to come up the most. Mm. And what sparked our conversation the most over this was last week uh, there were complaints made against Man vs. Meeple regarding paid-for content. Mm. So... They do a selection of reviews and previews and the complaint was made that it wasn't obvious that their preview video was a paid-for preview. Right. So what might first appear as a review piece, so they're critiquing a game, was actually them being paid to advertise it. And it's bizarrely quite appropriate in media in general because a few video game people have been, unfortunately, just slapped wrists lately because there's been issues regarding uh, several video game YouTubers advertising products and several advertising their own product. I don't think we've reached anywhere quite near the levels, mainly because the board game industry and the people who watch video ge- videos of board game reviews and what have you are nowhere near as large as numbers in video games. Mm. So I don't think we've reached the high level of controversies, but like this Man vs. Meeple, every so often it does rear its head. Mm. And... I just thought it was an opportunity for us to discuss reviewing games in general because there's lots of different ways to approach it and there's lots of different things that go around it that people always mute as complaints, really. Mm. Yeah, and we have a very a fairly solid standpoint on it ourselves, I would say. Well, since we say we are reviewing games, then yes, we have our 
opinion on it and our stance on it, yeah. Yeah, indeed we do. So, yeah, well, why, well, first of all, I think it's probably worth saying why we do what we do, Steve. Which is a pretty good question. <laughs> yeah. Which I hadn't really considered until uh, we're not Wizards podcast the other week. So I started doing reviews because at the time I started doing them, there wasn't a huge amount of what I thought of as quality written reviews. Video reviews were just starting to pick up, so Tom Vassell and Shut Up and Sit Down were just coming onto the scene. But I was really struggling to find a lot of good quality written reviews. I found a couple, but not many. And I just kind of thought there was an opportunity there. So I thought, uh, what the hell, let's give it a go. And I hope that what I've written is better quality than some of the things I'm criticising, but that's for other people to decide. Of course it is, Steve. <laughs> well, I'd like to think so. It's quite well informed, which puts you head and shoulders above most of the dross I've read. <laughs> uh, Andy. <laughs> you started Andy in video game reviews, didn't you? Because you had I did. Your video I did. Timely out, so- actually. And to be honest, for very similar reasons that you started doing the board game thing. Um, I mean, if anyone wants to see my stuff, it is on YouTube. I'm not going to give myself a big up because I haven't done it for quite a while, but I still exist. I haven't taken my site down. Um, but I did it for the same reason. Basically, I was getting fed up of seeing what I could only find, basically glorified instruction manuals from so-called reviewers. You know, you, you'll do this in the game, you'll jump, you'll press this, and you'll, you know, you'll, the character will, will do some kind of funky move, and then, you know, you'll climb up walls or whatever the hell it was. There wasn't an awful lot out there of what I would consider a review of the game in the sense of, you know, what's good, what's bad, does it look nice, does it feel good, are the controls stodgy, uh, how is the sound engineering, is the scripting good, is the characterization and the, the plot and all that sort of stuff, all the things around that. So I started doing it myself. I'm not going to sort of turn around and say I was amazing at it. I had a, um, a relatively loyal but small following um, at the end of my tenure. But given the opportunity to basically write for Polyhedron Collider, I've taken up Quill to Parchment, and done um, doing do what I do now, which to be fair is a very similar style of review. I think, obviously, just to, down, down to my own personal my own personality. It's just um, who you are, Andy. <laughs> basically, yes, I'm a I'm an objectionable, grumpy old bastard um, <laughs> with unfeasibly high standards. Um, but at the same time, if something is good, I will happily say it is good. And if it's dross, I will pound nails into it until it dies. <laughs> if it's a stone mild game, you will gush until the uh, the cows come home. <laughs> well, you say that, and yes, that's probably true. But to be fair, <laughs> Jamie does approach his his products in, in a sensible and, and, and straightforward manner. That's not to say his games are perfect. Um, Euphoria certainly has a couple of issues. And Scythe has taken some criticism from some people, not from me, but his games aren't perfect. Well, one of them isn't. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, if something is not done well or there are issues with it for whatever reason, you know, we, we uh, I'm quite happy to uh, almost stick the knife in. I mean, we've done it with this war of mine. Um, yeah. If you've read my review of the game, I was very, very positive, although it isn't perfect. You know, the mechanic where you're passing the book of, uh, book of scripts around, for example, feels a bit faffy. Steve's pointed out a few uh, criticisms of it as well. None of them stop it being a good game. It's just improvements that could be made. Yeah. So one of the things I would also say is we are not the only reviewers out there, and I think everyone should realise there's a plethora of reviews out there and find what meets their taste. Yeah. Mm either from a review style or from an actual taste in games. Yeah, I, th- I think that's a very important point, actually, Steve, because, I mean, speaking from a personal point of view, I mean, for video games, which I play fewer and fewer of these days, but for anyone who does play video games, you've probably heard of Zero Punctuation. Yahtzee is a very unique reviewing style. Good old Yahtzee. Um, yeah, very funny, very entertaining. But once you get through his style, I've found personally that I like very similar games to him. Mm -hmm. and dislike similar games to him for very similar reasons. You know, I like a plot. I like something with decent characterization, something you can actually get into, whereas a lot of people like Call of Duty and um, Modern Warfare, which I think is just dross, boring, samey nonsense. But it's very popular, you know, different people like different things. Yeah. I'd also say there's a different opinion on what reviewing style you like as well. 
I mean, you've already mentioned the video game reviews. You hated the one that's effectively an instruction manual. Mm. Mm. And I think that's one of the reasons why I started writing board game reviews is there too many board game reviews where here's 12 pages of how you play the game Yeah. with a sentence at the end says, oh, that's rather quite nice. Yeah. So that doesn't yeah. tell me anything about the game. If I want to read the yeah. instruction manual, I can go to the website of the of the publisher and download the bloody manual. You know, what's it like to play? Does it flow well? Is it easy to understand? Is it is it easy to teach? What's the component quality like? You know, all these sorts of things. How long does it take? How much does it cost? And interestingly enough, though, you will find people that complain that our style of reviewing doesn't go into enough detail about how the game plays. You know, mm. they they actually want to go through and read the rule book because mm. they'll go, Well, I'll make my own opinion of the game based on, you know, how I see it being played. Mm. But I think me, both me and Andy have decided that's not how we want to do reviews. And even yourself, John, you don't go into big detail when we talk on a podcast about the game mechanics and how you play. You'll pick out the mechanics that work. Yeah. And, and give an, o- an overview. You've got to pick out the salient points. But the thing I always think, like if I was going to buy a board game, I don't want to know. I don't want to listen to someone read out the rule book. <laughs> I'm interested in: is it a fun Paul. game? What's <laughs> what's the good stuff? What's the bad stuff? You know, I I'm not interested in the minute detail of every single rule that's in there. I mean, that's part of the reason I don't tend to write um, written reviews myself. You guys do a great job of that, and I read them. Believe it or not. <laughs> oh, really? Wow. Uh, but for me, doing written reviews isn't rewarding enough. Whereas talking about uh, how a game feels and whether it's fun to play and, you know, wh- you know how much of a good time we had playing it, that is rewarding for me. That's why I do this podcast. Mm. Mm. I think that's, that's very important because, I mean, ultimately, why do we play games? To have fun, to socialise with our friends or yep. enemies and to enjoy ourselves, to pass a couple of hours, you know, between cradle and grave. To keep our enemies close and push our friends further away. <laughs> Pretty much, yes, yes. And then murder them. <laughs> our enemies, obviously, not our friends. That that would be brutal. <laughs> yeah, that actually brings up one of the questions that was raised. Uh, the Game Pit podcast said, you know, do the people around the table, are they the biggest factor on your first play conclusions? And uh, do you know what? Who I can't you play the say game no. With, uh, who you play the game with has a massive effect on whether you enjoy the game or not. Definitely. Yeah. I would agree with that. Do you remember playing? Um, there was a game we reviewed on this very podcast, a Japanese one. Year ago, Blood and Fortune, or it was called. Yes, that's exactly the one. Yeah, yeah. Because that game, in reality, was pretty damn naff. Yes, yes, it but was. But we had fun playing it. Well, you speak for yourself. I thought it was shite. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we sure it was a shite game, but we had fun playing it. I didn't. I hated oh, no, it. It was fucking awful. No, you you on. played it with two different groups of people. That's it. Sorry, sorry. I, do, I stand corrected. You're right. <laughs> we played it and we hated it. Mm. I played it with a different set of people and they loved it because of the mood they took on when playing the game. What we saw was pointless decisions. The other group were like, ooh, I've given you this, I've given you that, what's going to happen here? And that was a game which felt completely different based on the players. Mm. And so, yeah, it does have to be considered who you're playing it with when you're playing the game. And some, sometimes a game will work with one group and it won't work with another. Mm. Yeah. I have to say, on, on that point, actually, um, we've, I've just reviewed uh, Drakkar from Space Balloon, which we did talk about, I think, last time. And it's just hit Kickstarter now. I'm just getting that plug in there. But it's a salient point, actually, <laughs> because I took it to our weekly board game group just you know, to get other people to play it, because it is a social game. And I played it with the Dry Euro crowd. And this is like a kind of lively party game with a bit of randomness and stuff in it. And I thought, they're probably not going to like it, but I'll try it anyway and see what we think. And you know what? They loved it. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're quite a mix there. They're not all Dry Euro gamers. Oh, no, this was the Dry Euro gamer crowd. We just oh, played okay. Sulkin. <laughs> 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 And they those are the it. ones that jump up on yes. the table like as if it's a mouse if you roll a dice. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Get that away from here. <laughs> Keep those facets away from me. <laughs> but they were only, you know, it's, it, it does play a big part, yes. It's the same with number of plays as well. Um, cause so, I, I, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, I've got the big list of questions on it and somebody did bring up how many times. Oh, that was it, Mark Tattersall did bring up the question about how many times do you play a game before you've got your opinion of it? And I think it depends a bit. It depends a lot. 
I always say, if I can play three uh, games, I will. But sometimes you can't. Yeah. Especially when it comes to Kickstarter games. Because, I mean, yeah. we've talked about Kickstarter for three quarters of the games we've mentioned this morning. This morning? Earlier in the podcast. It's a long podcast, <laughs> this. It's dragging on a bit. <laughs> for all you guys know, this we could have been recording for a whole yeah. day. <laughs> it's just you Steve's incredible Sometimes editing. it really feels like it. <laughs> Especially when someone forgets to press the record button. Andy! <clears throat> it's, that's only happened once. Yeah, but we'll never forget it. I'll no, never forgive don't you. I know it. <laughs> so, yeah, I, as I said, I always try and play a game. Three seems to be to me to be a magic number. I think first time is to learn the rules, second game is to learn the strategy, third is to form the opinion. But there are some games, especially simpler games, where the rules and strategy, you can, you can actually go for that entire gamut of opinion in one game yeah, and there's yeah. just some games which are just so bad that you like go mm. Mm. yeah that's interesting actually because i i agree that i think three is a, is a decent number but i just i think it just needs to be the way my brain or my personality works that i'm the sort of person who will form an opinion about something very very quickly you may have noticed <laughs> but andy what do you think <laughs> about i've got it <laughs> 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 but more so, and it's a bit seriously speaking that I'll pick something up I mean it's one of the reasons I back so many Kickstarters they just appeal to me and to be fair to this date I haven't actually been wrong or I've not picked up a complete dud yet <laughs> um, there's been some obviously better than others but playing a game you know that we've been sent for review the chances are I'll get a really good feeling of whether I'm going to like it or not just during the first playthrough and even just reading the rule book now, sometimes I've been surprised, pleasantly, thankfully. And, I mean, it's it's also worked the other way, thinking, oh, I quite enjoy this, and it turns out to be a complete turd. But um, <laughs> most of the time, my initial impression of what I think the game's going to be like isn't usually too far from the mark. I mean, there's been a couple of occasions where I've thought a game's going to be terrible, and then Steve's like, no, just persevere with it. And I have done, and I have changed my opinion of it, and things have got better. And I thought, okay, it's not actually that bad. But it's few and far between it can be weird as well because certain games your opinion will change i mean i haven't written a rev- i have not written mm. a review yet of either blood rage or spartacus and i know they're both very different games but i haven't written a review because every time i play those games my opinion flips to the other side Ooh. so blood rage for instance the first time i played that i went well, this is just a mess Second time I played it, I went, oh, no, I can see the strategy now. Oh, yeah, no, I can see where it is. I know what I'm doing now. Third time I played with what I thought was the strategy, and it was a mess again. (laughs) (laughs) And Spartacus I've felt very similar about. It took about four games with that before I thought I'd actually got everything right because the balance seemed out. And I think I've played about 10 times now, and I think if I'd written a review after my fourth playthrough, it would be a lot more positive than the one after my tenth playthrough. But yeah. if we waited till we played a game ten times before we a review, we'd have written about six reviews in the last three years. That's true. I mean, a time. I mean, we. Yeah. I mean, we we don't do this, you know, in our well, we do it in our spare time. We don't do it during the day because we all have mm. jobs. Sadly, you know, daddy isn't paying the rent. We have to do that ourselves. And of course, you know, with family to visit and friends and events and stuff, it's. I find it very very difficult to squeeze in more than one review a week if yeah. I'm honest to play play one game a week and even that at the moment I'm kind of struggling yeah which is one of the reasons why yeah. we've had a bit of a four week hiatus because we've all struggled to actually get some of these games in to talk mm. about on the podcast yeah yeah it's difficult but and because we're not paid for it sure if we were there'd probably be more of an impetus but that does raise I suppose the question of the day <laughs> yes I think, which I think is, it does help for us though that we've got three People who have, how do you describe it? Specializations in terms of um, what games we really enjoy. Taste, taste, John. Different tastes, yeah. But it means that if we, if all three of us play a game, like you get, we tend to get, I think, um, you know, reasonably varied opinion on all different sorts of aspects of the game. Like, mm. you know, we all we all particularly like certain types of games. And so if all three of us can get through a game and play it at least once or a couple of times, you're sort of multiplying up the experiences there. (laughs) 
Does that make yeah, sense? No, yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. No, yeah. I know what you mean. It is. It's 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 it's, it's a good point because essentially you've got three playthroughs from three different points of view in one playthrough. Mm. Yeah, kind of. It's still important um, to play it more than once because you know you might forget to um, turn the page in the rule book and escalate things, and it might turn out <laughs> to be really easily. Or you know you might misread a rule and it might be one and a half inches. No, sorry, half an inch. Uh, but <laughs> but if you well, have a couple of games, if you had a couple of games, and you've got you know some reasonably different opinions on what sorts of board games are good, I think you're going to end up, like you say, Steve, reasonably quickly. You'll have an idea of whether you need to play it another nine times or whether that's it, you've got the gist of it and we can we can review it, we can give it a score. Mm. I have found that hatred, ha- hatred is a lot easier to find than, than love. <laughs> Speak for yourself, Andy. <laughs> I, do. I do, I generally do. But again, it comes back to me being a miserable bastard. So That's one thing you've just raised there, actually, John. You mentioned the score and um, Mark from Aircon actually did ask about like five and ten point scoring systems. And I'm going to completely deflect the question because he's asking about what's the better kind of question, better kind of uh, review scoring system, and say we don't give game scores. Yeah, no, and that's something no. I decided right from the um. very beginning. I was not going to do a score because I hated scoring systems, especially hundred point scoring systems. You know, I'm going to give this game seventy seven point three, or <laughs> <clears throat> you know, yeah. I think it's 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 almost impossible. But I think it is impossible to represent a complex opinion numerically. You can't do it. <laughs> I think you're far better just highlighting what stuff you like, what stuff you don't like, and giving an overall, yep, yeah, we thought that one was good, or no, we fucking hate that <laughs> game. <laughs> I, th- I think the onus on this is that if you are reviewing something and you're doing a decent job of it, which I'd like to think we do, or at least Steve and I try to, that if you address all of the points in the game that you like and or dislike, and provide solid reasons why, i.e., you are constructive in your criticism or critique. Yeah, and if you justify then your that's opinions. That's helpful. Exactly, exactly. You don't just turn around and go, oh, components are shit, mm. and just say why. I think that's far more useful and beneficial for, for people because people might go into a game like, for example, Betrayal House on the Hill. Steve and I can't stand Betrayal House on the Hill, but it's very, very popular. Because you know, there's certain things that we, as players, and I think you're probably on the same opinion, John, that we had this discussion a few podcasts ago, that mm-hmm. being when we, we play a game and we find a game that is good because we make meaningful decisions, whereas in that particular game, despite its popularity, it's felt that we don't make meaningful decisions in that game. Everything's based on either drawing a tile or rolling a dice. Now, people still enjoy it, and that's fair enough. But if we can put that, you know, that, that that justification down, people who are reading our reviews will look at that and go, "Well, actually, yeah, that's the sort of game I do or don't enjoy." You know, this is this is why I read Polyhedron Collider. If we really need to get you else. to play Talisman again, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah, re- representing that complex opinion. I mean, how how do you re- uh, how do you how do you represent the like of a mechanic numerically. I mean, every review is going to be a, a personal and subjective opinion. Of course it is. And, and that that has to be iterated as well, because that comes up every so often, people saying that board game reviews are too subjective. Well, by their very nature, they have to be subjective. We're not reviewing washing machines here. <laughs> you know, I can, <laughs> and even then they can be, because aesthetics well, are, yeah, are, but, are subjective. Uh, yeah, but but I know a washing you machine, they can be objective. Yeah, I have put red wine and this white shirt and this washing machine did not get it out or this washing machine did it's an extremely objective you know if you do an objective review of a board game it should be a it should be a personal advert <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> but you can't do that kind of review of a board game oh this board game weighs two and a half kilograms that's exactly 300 that's components. beyond my two kilo <laughs> yeah. threshold and therefore it's out yeah but it's a fair point i mean the subjectivity issue steve is obviously relevant because everyone has a personal opinion now the question is, I think the important question is, is how that subjectivity in, in terms of opinion is affected when money is involved. Uh, I did go sit further because, than that and say when reimbursement is involved. Because, okay, uh, yes. In some kind of incentive, incentive let's, let's put it that incentive, way. Incentive, yeah. yeah. Because I think anyone who turns around and says, oh, it shouldn't matter, you should still be objective, is extremely naive... It probably depends to a certain extent how professional 
Well, it doesn't. So, so, it really doesn't. So, because, so, let me explain. Say, just to say, when we say incentive and, and reimbursement, is there are some people who have been paid to write reviews, and there are some people, uh, mm. some people, those people are paid via advertising. So they advertise on their YouTube channel or they advertise on their website. Some of them, which is becoming the most common way, is like a Patreon or a Kickstarter where they've raised funds to fund themselves to do the job. So uh, the actual lol is doing a Kickstarter at the moment. The other one is review copies. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody sends us a review copy of a game, which they do. There is an argument that says, well, if that game costs £40, we've effectively been given £40. Okay. Mm. And so those are kind of the main ways. And then the last way, which is the one which is the most, the one which causes the most controversy, is when somebody has actually been paid by a publisher to do a review. Mm. Yeah, and that's the bit I want to address yeah. now, because I think the other three ways. I mean, okay, receiving game copies of games is yeah, okay, it's a nice, it's a nice thing. But you've addressed this before because it's not always a finished copy. Some of the components are a bit shoddy. It's not there are, representative. There are two classes of that. Yeah, there are two game. classes that. There are the Kickstarter previews we get. They, they go from they go <laughs> from basically someone has made this on their home printer and cut it out to a pre-production copy, which is almost as good as the real thing. But we've also been sometimes haven't even cut it out. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> You've got to do it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but That's we true. also do get sent full copies of games. Now they're not mm. Room Wars, yeah. for example, and we don't get sent a massive amount of them. And I'm going to hold my hand up now and say. We are not brilliant on the podcast of saying what we've been sent as review copies. As a critic mm. of myself. In fact, as advertising standards agency and in the American, it's covered by the FTC, but I can't remember what FTC stands for. We should say that we've been sent a review copy before we do a review. Mm. Because it's a clear indication that we've been reimbursed for doing this. Mm. I think we're actually okay on this particular podcast because the three things we've talked about are all yeah, Kickstarter yeah. copies. <laughs> So we're okay. Um, but yeah, on the written reviews, I, you know, there is a caveat at the bottom of every single review that says this is either a Kickstarter prototype or this is a review copy. And if that caveat isn't there, yeah. it means we've bought the game with our own money. Which is usually the case for me, actually. It's no wonder I'm skin. <laughs> um, Dedicated to the, the f- cause, Andy. <laughs> yes, yes, that's the best way of putting it. Dedication to, <laughs> you know, and, and some kind of loathing of my own money or something, I don't know. Fanaticism. <laughs> addiction you know something like that yes um but i think the issue steve said the the biggest problem is the 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 latter of the cases where people are paid by publishers and or shops to produce a review for a game now i have a fundamental issue with that and anyone who says that's not a biased process is clearly an idiot because there is a vested interest you could look at this and say right okay fine the reviewer reviews that game financially objectively, if that makes sense, i.e. they have a subjective opinion about the game and they review it one way or the other. Great, fine. No problem with that. The issue is, in reality, is that review, if it's negative, is that ever going to see the light of day? Because the publisher is not ever going to publish a negative review about their own product because they want to they sell stuff. A shop is not gonna is gonna do the same principle. I mean, Gillette is never advertised as the worst a man can get, <laughs> is it? They always get positive reviews for to sell a product. It's marketing. You never ever have bad marketing from from a from a company. It's it's counterproductive. Consequently, any reviewer who produces a review is only ever gonna get in this instance from a produ- from a being paid by a publisher or a shop is only ever gonna get a positive review published. And therefore, there is an inherent bias in the market. What about if um, someone pays you to review a game? You you come up with your review, and your review says, "I hate this game. It's shit. But, I don't well, like it." Wait, wait. Let me finish. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I decide that it's a shit game, and you say to the publisher, "Look, you can decide not to pay me, but I'm going to publish this anyway." Uh, this is There's my opinion. There's the thing, though. There's the thing, though. You can publish that on your own website, and that's fine. But the problem is, these are not going to be published on independent websites. These are going to be published on the produ- on the publisher's or the shop's website. Right, I see what you mean. That's the difference. Now, for example, Steve or I could get paid to review something and publish on Polyhedron Collider. That's fine. We could do that. There's nothing wrong with that. But, but, it's but very I, unlikely but to happen. I would say we wouldn't. 
No, we I'm going to make no, that clear actually not. because we've have, we've have, we've we've been offered once. We have been really? offered a financial incentive to write a review. It was mm. a Kickstarter review, and it was very timely. And in the end, I well, I did actually straight away from said I'm not accepting money. I accept a review copy of the game, but I'm not. Money is never to change hands when I'm doing Polyhedron Collider. And I've said that right mm, from the start because of that very reason. Because if they've paid us money, immediately someone goes to say, "Well, you're not. You're biased on this." The other problem was mm. they wanted a ridiculous See. turnaround, which is why they were offering money, and it was just like, no, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Now, the thing is, I don't personally necessarily see an issue with us being able, if if we choose to be paid for something and publishing it on Polyhedron Collider. I think that's better because it's an independent site, and if somebody wants to link to that, that's better. However... It's your choice. Obviously, you don't want to be paid. You don't want to be paid. That's you know more independent and as independent as it gets. Yeah, the that's... issue here is that people are getting paid to publish to to have reviews on publishers' websites, and that, that that's, is massive that's not conf- very common, conflict of no, interest. Because what we're talking about is we're talking about like Man versus Meeple is the one that sparked this thing, and that was on mm. their own website. So that's on their own YouTube channel where they did a preview and been paid for the preview. Mm. Now. There's very few reviews appear on publishers' own websites in this industry, thankfully. There's not very many board game publishers will post a review. Shops is a different matter. There seems to be quite a few shops that post reviews. Uh, Yeah, that's starting to enter dodgy ground. That to me is dodgy ground as well, because, you know... It's a conflict of interest. Yeah, in the end, you're selling those items, aren't you? Uh, Exactly. And again, the same argument carries, that if somebody produces a bad review... That, that review's not going to go on that website. Ergo, the reviewer thinks, well, there's no point in me producing a bad review because I'm not going to get, it's never going to see the light of day. I'm not going to get publicity for it. No one's going to recognize my work. Therefore, it's in my own interests to produce a positive review, whether I like the game or not. Ergo, introducing bias. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's. I, I still think just if you're ropey. an independent reviewer and someone offers you some money to do a review and you then publish it regardless of whether. The outcome, you know, whether you, whether it was a positive review or a bad one, it depends whether people trust your, you know, your ethics as a reviewer. I think extent. that's a problem as well because what what we have seen in the board game industry is as soon as people get wind that people have money has changed hands, and I mean money, I mean they still argue this happens with review copies, but especially with money changing hands, the argument then comes out, well, we don't trust you anymore, and this yeah. has come out quite yeah. a few times. Yeah, there is a, definitely an integrity issue because there's always the. I mean, it's it's the same in in any industry. I mean, Jesus, look at Jeff Gersman. You mentioned video games before, Steve, and Gamespot. Do you remember that oh, a few yeah. years ago? Jeff Jeff Gersman used to work for Gamespot. He was quite a well respected reviewer, and he uh, he reviewed the game Kane and Lynch, and he absolutely panned it because, quite rightly, it's shit, and so was its sequel. It was what? What, what was the uh, the phrase that uh, Yahtzee used to describe the sequel? Was Kane and Lynch two dog days is worse than deep fried tampons? <laughs> That's a direct quote. Uh, but Jeff reviewed this poorly, negatively, and he was sacked from Gamespot because Kane and Lynch was being advertised on the Gamespot website alongside the review and therefore you know the super saver package deal included you know a good review and a, and a bit of advertising on Gamespot he was sacked because apparently they weren't allowed to say anything bad about this dross of a game which is obviously introduces um skepticism about a reviewer's integrity Do you remember say, aliens cloning marines I've never played it, but I am aware it. of it being a turd. Yes, the first review of that <laughs> to come out uh, was on a website. I can't even remember the name of the website. It was a small, smaller, independent, more independent video games website. And it was a, it's the first review, and I remember reading it because I was quite excited about this game. So I love the Aliens franchise. And it was a glowing review. And even at the time, people said, oh, hang on, it's a glowing review surrounded by an advert for Alien Colonial Marines. Yeah. How much do we trust this review? And then, funnily enough, within days, the embargo broke, the real review started coming out, and everyone absolutely panned it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's dodgy ground. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting question, because I mean, I've been mulling this over, as you, you alluded to. I mean, Steve and I have been talking about this for 
a good few weeks, actually, basically since Man vs. Meeple issue kicked off. And it is something I think we both feel very strongly about. Um, the, I mean, I am categorically against, you know, publishers paying for reviews and then publishing those reviews on their own websites. Now, if they pay for a review and that review is published on the reviewer's website, I'm less dicey about it, like you've just uh, said, John, because there's a, a degree of independence there. There's also still the question as to whether the, uh, any positive review has been... Purchased. You know, the, the, the review has been... <laughs> it, well, I wouldn't go so far as to say per possibly, but I think... Or at least swayed. The reviews... The, the, yeah, swayed. I think the positivity may have been enhanced, enhanced slightly by the promise of financial reimburse or any form of reimbursement. So I'm quite surprised here. I um, thought your view would be much stronger on this. I thought you would be more in line with my thoughts that this at all was a bad thing. I'm I mostly do agree with you, but I, I think I don't as know. soon as you as soon as you start entering that, it does it does raise the questions. But yeah. personally, maybe just because I feel like I'm reasonably good at giving an honest opinion about whether I like something or not, and whether or not I was, you know, given a, a copy of the game, wouldn't affect. <laughs> I I know that it wouldn't affect my review of the game. You know, it wouldn't affect my enjoyment at all. It's just whether I enjoyed playing it and stuffing Andy. <laughs> or uh... <laughs> <laughs> the question is, you've got to look at your own business continuity because ultimately this is a business question. Yeah. Because you can get you can get sent one review one one review a game to review from a publisher and they'll pay you for it. Fine, great, wonderful, and you pan it. You're honest and you're open. You're you're completely you know subjective in uh, sorry objective in terms of your your critical opinion of it. You know you've you've torn it apart. You don't like it for whatever you know good reasons. You retained your reviewer integrity. The problem is you've got a, you, the publisher is then going to consider actually do we really want to review. Or do we want to pay another this reviewer again for another game if he's going to destroy it, tear it apart? You've essentially, potentially, broken um, a lucrative bond, shall we say? Or you may you you're obviously not. It's not in the publisher's interests to use you again because there's the, another risk that you'll pan another one of their games, and therefore they will then a not use you again. Because it's not in their interest to to publicise negative reviews, it's because they don't sell stuff. Therefore, your interests as a reviewer are potentially swayed because you want you know you want to be able to review things. You like getting you like getting paid. You know, don't we all? It's nice to receive uh, review copies. So, therefore, your professional uh, integrity may be broken because you've decided actually I'm going to positively review a game that might be a complete turd. And therefore, bias is then introduced again. This is why we don't get paid for reviews. It's not because well, we wouldn't like thing, to. So. It's because we've slated at least one game from every publisher and none of them will touch us anymore. <laughs> not well, this, that we ever well, did. It's, but. <laughs> it's, it's a valid point, though. And I, 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 I must admit, I mean, now, now Steve's put me on the spot and asked me the question, I'm going to stick with him <laughs> and say, actually, I would rather maintain the position we've got and not raise the question of you know integrity and by by being steadfastly neutral on the subject financially, mm. at least because it, it yeah oh, you you mentioned you seem to be talking mostly about money there, Andy. But I think John, you've hinted at it there about at what point does getting a review copy of the game fall into the same thing? Because you talk about like the latest game for Fantasy Flight Games, you're approaching a hundred pound for a copy of that game now. RRP before we mm, discuss that. True. You, so you were effectively. In a way, being paid £100, if you were going to buy this game anyway, that is, it can be argued, to review it. I actually think, I think if a reviewer gives us a review copy, there's more chance that we're going to slate it. Purely because the only reason... Well, because you know I'm a, I'm a git. <laughs> no, no, the, because uh, the only reason that we you know, go out of our way to buy the game, especially if it's 100 quid, the only reason we go out of our way to buy a game is because at least one of us thought we'd enjoy it. So if anything, if a publisher were to pay us, <laughs> there's a better chance that it's going to be slated because they paid us to get a review out there, you know, by by giving us a get a review copy. 
<laughs> to finish say that, John, because that's the argument against review copies has always been this: that you know you're getting a copy of the game, so you're therefore being paid in product to do a review. So yeah. therefore, you can either mm. a benefit a benefit of review. And I did see someone on a Facebook group the other day, and I can't remember their name, so I can't even name them, shame them, saying, "Oh, I don't want to leave a negative review because that might ruin my dealings with this publisher." So it does happen; people do do this. But I also argue if you sp- there are people out there who will have spent £100 in this game and now will defend this game no matter what because they have to justify <laughs> ah, their own purchase. the fanboy. Well, yeah, it's part, part fanboy, part have to justify that they've spent 100 quid on this. Yeah. Mm. That's all right. I spent 35 quid on Betrayal at House on a Hill. I fucking tore it apart because it's wank. <laughs> what if it was 150 quid, though? <laughs> well, I'd be very disappointed. Be but I mean, you do raise, you, Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, I mean, you, you do raise a good point, John that, you know, you spend that much on a game, the chances are you've probably looked around, ironically, at reviews, and found out, um, <laughs> is it worth me getting or not? But, I mean, that's not to say, you know, a £100 game is, is really worth having. I mean, yeah. Blood Rage wasn't cheap. No. Steve's still on the yeah. fence. I, I, I bought that at retail. I think I spent about 60 quid. Still not entirely mm. sure if, I, if that money was money well spent. Mm. I mean, I've I bought Doom and I spent best part of sixty quid on that, but purely by virtue of the fact that the video game is awesome. And traditionally, I think you could probably say that more conversions to cardboard from video are bad rather than good. So there was a real risk that FFG have basically done a balls up. Thankfully, it's not the case, and Doom's actually pretty good. But there is that risk, you know. When you shell out a hundred quid, oh god, you know, lots of people think this is great, but. Do, will I think it's great? I don't know. It's a fair point, John. It is a fair point. Mm. So that, that leads us on to a couple of the questions that people have asked, so we can kind of lead into that. So you've said, you know, when we're buying a game, we look at other reviews. So how much do we actually consume other reviews? And Creaking Shelves has asked us, who are our favourites? I think he's fishing for compliments. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can uh, hand on heart say that I don't look at any reviews. But I don't listen to very many podcasts. <laughs> John, man, man under a rock cage. <laughs> <laughs> I just have, a man in the cave. I just have too many hobbies. I think that's the that's the bottom line. I love playing board games. Uh, I love talking about them, but I don't have as much time as I would like to fish around for. But you're more of a practical purchaser, aren't you? You're more likely to buy a game after you've played it with us than to just go out and buy a game sight unseen. Very true, but part of the reason for that is that you guys play so many fucking board games. <laughs> it's so unlikely that there's a new game out there that you guys won't have uh, either kickstarted Andy <laughs> uh, <laughs> or managed to wangle a review copy at least briefly to have a crack at. So, I mean, I'm in, in quite an unusual and very lucky position, which I'm very grateful for. <laughs> I mean, I, I have to admit, I don't actually read that many reviews. Um, of games. I mean, I, I come back to what I said before about me forming an opinion of something quite quickly. Mm. And it's the same when I go out and buy stuff, generally. Um, you know, oh, that Kickstarter looks fun. Let's have a look at that. I mean, yeah, I mean, I remember John asking me about a game I'd backed on Kickstarter. Andy, how does it play? I haven't got a clue, John. <laughs> <laughs> just look pretty. That's... <laughs> exactly, pretty much. Yeah, it just looked like the sort of game I'd probably enjoy. I can't even remember what game it was, but... There's no way I would back a game if that's all I had to go on. So, yeah, you're right. You're right, Steve. I am a practical... Which uh... is usually what you're doing Ooh. with Kickstarter. You are taking a big gamble on Kickstarter. I mean, even even the last few weeks, I mean, um, everyone's gone about seven continents, and I didn't back it because it was like, uh, it looks nice, but I don't know enough about it to be confident in backing it, so... Do you know what? I looked at it and went, nah, not interested. It's the same with Gloomhaven. Everyone went berserk over Gloomhaven, yourself included. And I looked at it and went, nah, but that's my opinion yeah. forming again. I just wasn't interested in the slightest. It's weird. I will, depending on the game and the publisher, I will quite often just take a punt knowing mm. that certain pedigree. For, for instance, Star Wars Rebellion, I bought Star Wars Rebellion more or less day one. Didn't wait for a single it review because it just looked right up my street. It was FFG, it was Star Wars. It was a massive dude to the mm. map game with miniatures. Ticked a lot of boxes. Take my money! <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, Oh, to be fair, it's pretty good. 
But things like Gloomhaven, <laughs> things like Seventh Continent, um, I was never going to back it, but I was intrigued by Kingdom Death Monster. So for some of these mm. other things, uh, like I didn't back, I backed, I backed the second printing of Gloomhaven. I didn't back the founders from, of Gloomhaven Kickstarter because I didn't see enough yeah. reviews of that to make myself confident with it or enough reviews of people I trusted, if that made sense. Yeah, I mean, I was about to say, I mean, I think I go off, I don't read that many reviews at all, to be honest. I mean, I see a few, you know, banded around, you know, I'm on websites, poke around, here's a customer review, here's an actual review, whatever it is. And I'll, I'll cast an eye over them. But most of the time, if I'm going to buy something or I'm interested in something, it's probably because I've heard it through someone else. You know, the Facebook groups or in a shop or online, even, you know, falling for clickbait sucker adverts. Ooh, that looks interesting. What's that? You know, on Amazon or Chaos Cards or whatever the hell it is. And go, oh, that's quite interesting. And then you read open it and you, and you get the you get the blurb for the game. And to be honest, that's usually enough for me. If I'm intrigued enough and it's a shitload of money, then I'll probably look into it a bit more. I thought you were going to say I'll back it because it's a lot of money. <laughs> If there's an opportunity you know, three, for part with it, it's 300 part quid, and you know, it'll do. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, there's, there's 150 miniatures. Oh, it's only 300 quid. Yeah, that'll do. It'll be fine. There must be a reason it's 300 quid. I'd better back this one. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, but I mean, I, I have to admit, I'd completely forgotten about Kingdom Death Monster, actually, Steve, because I was intrigued by that as well. But everything I'd heard around it, it was like, mm, it's a bit meh. So I didn't bother. Well, I mean, to give an example of, I mean, I do consume obviously a lot more reviews than you do. I listen to podcasts, so uh, I always listen to The Secret Cabal, and there's about five of them, so they get a, a decent spread of their opinions. And I must admit, I don't tend to, games that are brand, brand new, I don't look for reviews for. I just, you know, like Star Wars Rebellion, I tend to make a, a decision like yourselves, just based on instinct. And mm. I'll listen to or watch reviews of, or read reviews of slightly older games that I've either not seen much about or I'm not sure about. So so the reviews yeah. I listen to, I listen to Secret Cabal because I think my taste in games is similar to most of the crew there, which I think is important. Um, yeah. I listen to the Brawling Brothers podcast, but that can be... I'm not quite sure where I sit with them at the moment with regard to their tastes. That reviews... I read a lot of the a written review I will go through like quickly so you know yes Matt you your reviews are good I do read them uh Luke's when he does a written <laughs> review I tend to do them but I tend to scan but I, I scan read a lot of things anyway so I will quickly go down mm. and find the bit I'm interested in video reviews yeah, yeah. I quite like shop and sit down reviews but my tasting games I found is quite different especially Quinn's shut up and sit down i think my taste in games is the complete opposite of his so games which he has <laughs> hated i've loved and games that he's loved i've hated so sure. I, I mean I've, I've seen a few of the shut up and sit down stuff and i, I like their their style but i do find them a bit long yeah i i there was shut up and sit down this week i was watching i was watching no pun included as well so fk um, and I mm. found some of them were a little bit long. I found myself, my attention was waning after 10 minutes. Mm. So again, I kind of just, I might skip forward a little bit and try and get to the, the juicy bits of the review. <laughs> Interestingly enough, I was watching Shut Up and Sit Down's review of First Martians, which got quite a bit of a panning because it said the review, the, the, the rule book is rubbish. Mm -hmm. But it made me really want to play it. <laughs> It was quite bizarre. It was a negative review that made me want to go play it. And I've been looking at the price of it going, oh, should, should I take a punt on it's this? It's curiosity, thing? isn't it? Because I think part the of you think, is it really that bad? Is everybody else a moron? Yeah. I need to give <laughs> my opinion on this. And I guess that's probably why we do reviews. People need to hear our opinion. Coming on to what I was going to finish that off with. So there's three of us here which are doing board game reviews, of which only one of us actually watches or listens to board game reviews or reads them, which means... I listen to podcasts. Right, okay. Yeah, I was going to say, I, it's not that I don't read any reviews, just compared to you guys. I don't. I have less reason to do it. So I do, I do still watch uh, odd bits and pieces and look at the odd bits and pieces... It's it's just rare that there's a board game that you guys haven't already spoken about that I that I feel like I need to go and look elsewhere for. So do you do yeah. you have a go to reviewer, John, or do you just do a search for reviews in that game and just poke around a bit? Just just Google. I mean, most of the guys that you mentioned, I've read reviews for one thing or another, just out of interest. But like you say, I'd have skimmed them. Yeah, 
I'm listening to more podcasts these days. I feel like I've got a backlog of um, still stuck on that bloody Dragon's Horde one. <laughs> I just feel like I need to get to the present and then I finished all the backlog and then I can go and branch out and go and look at some more stuff. It's only a 20 minute drive each way on my way to work. So if you've got an hour long podcast, and there's something like 30 odd that I've got to get through because it's a story. One of the questions we did have regarding this, and it goes back to the ethics thing, is Sven um, asks, do you reckon a Gamergate kind of conflict could happen within the board game hobby, or are we too inclusive to stoop that low? Now, do you... What's Gamergate? Well, there we go then. <laughs> right, so there are two sides to Gamergate, depending on whether you're a prick or not a prick. <laughs> Steve, you've well, been around got... me far too long, <laughs> channeling me. We've got a good sample of both sides of the argument here. No, so... no neither of you two are this level John, of John, don't be so hard on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <laughs> the the prick's excuse, I think actually prick is too light a word. Douchebag. I want to say country music singer, really. Right, yeah. <laughs> now, I don't know 100% about Gamergate. Gamergate... I struggle to piece together exactly what happened, and I've read that Wikipedia article about 10 times now. Most of it falls around, I can't remember a name now, is it something, Zoe something, who yes. wrote a game and there was an accusation she got a positive review because she slept with a reviewer. Or oh, words to that effect. Mm. Well, they were dating beforehand, weren't they? Yeah, I think so. I, I, as I said, I don't know. Mm. I'm not. I'm not going to touch the details of this because there are, in my opinion, it, there's so much bullshit around this Gamergate thing that trying to decipher the facts are important, are, are difficult. <laughs> there's a lot of conjecture. There's a lot of conjecture, but here's here's the upshot of it. A lot of people started arguing that there was no integrity in video game reviews, that people were being paid, similar to the GameSpot thing you mentioned earlier. Yeah. However, the majority of people use this as an excuse to abuse this girl. Send her death threats, abuse, basically ruined her life. Yeah, she had to change her number and stuff, yeah. Absolute country music singers, these people. Similar to Ghostbusters 2016. Fucking awful film. People had just seen the review or the 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 the, the, um, the trailer for it and decided, okay, it's a bad film, and ultimately it was, but they abused the actress the actresses. Yeah. They send them death threats and send them racial abuse and goodness knows what else. It's like that's completely out of order. It's not necessary. There's some very wrong people in the world. Mm. So what? The internet makes you, well, seems to make a lot of people a lot more aggressive than they, they should be. Because they or can it's hide. an outlet for people who would otherwise be aggressive elsewhere. Oh, did you hear about that yes. program? Was it, was it, was it, was it or not, as the case may be. Did that TV program, was it in Scandinavia somewhere? Oh, I can't remember which Scandinavian country it was, whether it was Denmark or Norway or something like that, where it was a TV programme where they found uh, like women who'd been abused online on Twitter and um, traced down the trolls and uh, like live TV faced off at them and say, you wrote this and this. And it's usually like... Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah and I just basically watched them squirm. <laughs> See? You know, you can hide behind the internet. You know, you actually would you actually say those things to somebody's face in real life? 99% of the time, I reckon probably not. Any, anyway. Anyway, if sorry. you're Andy. <laughs> <laughs> Getting back on point. So there's, there's, there's two views of what Gamergate is. There's the whole thing which we've, we've already discussed about the GameSpot and there's this absolute tirade of abuse that occurred. And I think what Sven is getting at is, do we think that this could happen in, in the horrible way, this kind of tirade of abuse and misogyny and sexism? Could that occur in our industry or... Are we above it as board gamers? I'd like to say we're above it. I mean, there have been, obviously, I mean, we, we go through, you, know, you mentioned these things go in cycles, Steve. I remember a few months ago there was the issue raised, I mean, probably actually raised by Kingdom Death Monster, actually, and its portrayal of the fairer sex as being a little misogynistic and you know slightly less clad than the male counterparts and obviously it kicked off this this argument about the representation of women in gaming and it i would think it's fair to say that board gaming is unfortunately a male dominated hobby at present although we don't want it to be we'd like yeah. more women involved um, we actively I, encourage more women into the indeed hobby. yes I, I rather enjoy the company of the ladies um, so please come and play with us, games, that is. Well, yeah, I'll, <laughs> never mind. 
<laughs> Andy, that sounded like a ringing. Uh, I'm thus undermining my own argument just... there completely, <laughs> yes. completely accidentally. But I don't think uh... it would, to be honest, because we we are inclusive. You know, we don't. I mean, the vast majority of us, from what I've experienced anyway, um, are not. We're not deliberately excluding the ladies. It's just. <laughs> we don't attract them as much as we'd like. I just I don't even think any of us are that much of a wanker, to be honest. No, that's absolutely true. What I would say is what I've seen of things of what people have said online and such like, and what people have said have happened in conventions, and they always the argument is just because you haven't seen it happen doesn't mean it happens. Yeah. Um my experience of what I've heard is we in the UK are a bit better at this. Um, you only have to look at like what people that attend UK Games Expo, um, which just like all gaming stuff, it's going to be predominantly male bearded people that looks like my Skype screen at the moment. Um, <laughs> but compared to what you see of the videos and pictures of Gen Con, I would say the UK Games Expo seems to be a lot more diverse. Mm, agreed. I'm not saying the problem doesn't exist, but I think the problem is slightly less in this country. Do you think it's just because the kind of culture over in the US has opened it up to more people? And so ultimately we're going to end up, you know, going the same sort of way? Well, I think UK Games Expo is an interesting slice of it. And I think actually Aircom might be a little bit of a better understanding because UK Games Expo has made a big point of trying to make it open for families. They made mm-hmm. a big point of putting family areas in, encouraging family game makers to come along. Um, and Aircon, which is the other convention we go to, might be a better example because although they're not discluding every, anyone, I don't think Aircon have kind of been as focused on this as as the family thing as uh, UK Games Expo were. But at the same time, I don't remember sitting in that room in Aircon and thinking, bloody hell, this is a sausage fest. No, not at all. I was about to say, actually, I, despite you know Mark and the rest of his team active, not actively promoting it as a family event or you know women come along here, we desperately need you. It was a friendly atmosphere. There were women there, there were men there, there were there were there were families there. You know, they sat down mm. next to us. Mm. You know, there were kids playing Ticket to Ride and stuff, and it was a really great atmosphere. So, I, I mean, from that point of view, it was an extremely successful. I'd like to think representative of the industry event mm. because it was just, you know, come along and play games. I felt with both of those um, conventions that the fact that there were a lot more men than women there was like a coincidence rather than, you know, because someone was being excluded. Mm. You know, it's just it's just a fact that at the moment there are generally a lot more guys into board games. I think as an industry it is a lot more... Is a lot more diverse than that. I mean, we talk about conventions, and this is quite a few years back. I remember going to the guitar show in the NEC, and Jesus, that was just wall to wall men. The the only women in there were the the booth babes, which is a bit <laughs> weird as well. <laughs> Thankfully, we don't have many booth babes. <laughs> they do exist, though. Yeah. I've seen the odd one or two. I think to answer Sven's question, I think no. I don't think it would get to that point because I think there's far too many people within the industry that wouldn't allow it. Yeah. And if somebody did kick off like that, they'd be ostracised extremely quickly. I mm. think so as well, Probably yeah. Right. Well, I'd like to hope so. I hope so. Yeah. I'd li- I would like I, to think so. I, I want to agree with you, but I, I, I'm never quite sure just what darkness is lurking underneath the internet's veneer. Well, yeah. Well, there's a lot of darkness. It is the internet after all. I mean, to be fair, I mean, you know, I mean, we're we're members of you know the UK um, gaming group run by Chris. There's another plug for you, Chris. And to be fair, <laughs> any shenanigans in that group is swiftly acted upon. To be mm. fair, and much quicker than some of the other groups on Facebook, I've noticed. Yeah, I mean, Chris and Martin, they do a really good job of admin in that. And if there is any shenanigans, they come down on you like a ton of bricks, and rightly so. So, what have uh, you done, Andy? <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing, not me. I was a victim, actually, this time, believe it or not. Wow. Yeah, I got stiffed out of about 60 quid. Mm. Yeah. For what? Um, I was trying to buy a copy of Mansions of Madness, second edition, from mm. um, a particularly dodgy guy who'd basically sold possibly even a mythical copy of it to about three of us because I wasn't the only victim in this scam. And it turns out that he, he, he'd done this a few times to quite a few people, it turns out. Um, so, I mean, it wasn't enormous amounts of money per individual, 
but it was enough to become significant and rather annoying um, for the yeah. rest of us. So, we, you know, basically, honestly trying to trade games through the post. Um, so he was tracked down and, well, not beaten, but he was removed from the group. He tried to form another personal, another profile on Facebook, joined the group again, but everyone sort of, the internet, the internet detectives found him out and he was kicked out for good. So uh, the the community is quite solid when it wants to be. I just hope mm. it remains in a positive sense. Okay, well, we'll just quickly round off with a couple of these questions then to try and cover stuff we've uh, we've not really covered in the general discussion. So Bez, who's asked 101 bloody questions, asks, what responsibility do you feel as a reviewer? And gives examples of trying with different groups and play next times, which we've we've covered that, but... Is there anything else you'd like you'd say you uh, you have a responsibility as a reviewer? Yes, I think the responsibility is to be. I mean, I've I've touched on it already in my sort of speech before, but I think being professional, being informed, being constructive more than anything else. Um, don't go on a tirade of just you know saying something shit and not giving a reason. Um, there Back is the your, onus all your on opinions the re- is definitely crucial. Absolutely. I would say. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yes. Um, you know, approach it almost in a, I'd say, a scientific manner, an engineering professional manner. I mean, I've got the advantage here, obviously, I think we all have, that we do these sorts of things professionally anyway, in the sense that we write professional documents to clients and all this sort of stuff. So we've got to be, and it's the industry we work in, so we have a lot of, quite a lot of experience of doing this. But I guess not everyone has that luxury. But the onus on the reviewers is, you know, be constructive, be sensible, be professional but at the same time i'm going to turn it around and say the onus on the publishers is to take any criticism on the chin yeah don't just throw your toys out of the pram and go right you're not reviewing anything else um i mean it comes obviously back, back to integrity but which leads us right onto actually one of other bez's questions which was what's the best slash worst reaction you've ever had to a review both from the publishers designers and general audience <laughs> all I need to say is have a look on the board game group, the American one, and my post for Betrayal at House on the Hill. That would be the, the best one, right, Andy? It would be an example of the community being opposed to my opinion, shall we say. That was both <laughs> the best and worst response, I think, from the community <laughs> in general. Um, the biggest one I seem to have is... Uh, Complaints against or people um, thoughts from people is okay. You always get the one put comment who says, "I think you're wrong," and mm. the best ones of those go, "I think you're wrong because this, this, and this," which starts a discussion, which is really nice. The worst ones that just go, the ones go, "You are wrong," which is basically what you got on that trail in the house and the hill review. Mm. <laughs> no no yeah. discussion, just you're wrong. There's a few that have come up lately, which uh, it's interesting actually. This, this gets covered in a couple of other questions again. I think it's a man from Aircon asked this. I've been criticised in my reviews of Fancy Flights products when I start discussing price, especially when I've started discussing the miniatures games and the LCGs. Mm. Mainly because I do have an issue with their products, especially the LCG core set issue where you effectively have to buy two or three core sets and then 50% of what you bought is then completely useless. So the reaction I keep getting, I've had a few people have reacted to that in a really negative way where I've brought this up as an issue, which I think is an important issue to consider, especially if you're completely new to this game. I've gone, well, yeah, duh, it's pretty obvious you're going to have to spend this money. It's like, oh, right, okay, I was trying to be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. The other one which I find comes a bit up when we talk about price is I always quote RRP in a review. And I tried to do it on the bod- podcast as well, because yeah. if you're going to go to a brick and mortar shop, that's typically what you're going to pay. And the response always comes back. Let's say, for instance, we mentioned the Fantasy Flight games, which are 100 quid. You know, Rune Wars mm-hmm. is RRP of just, just shy of 100 quid. Well, someone comes up and yeah. goes, well, this is on sale, such and such a place, it's 60 pounds. Yeah. Bonus, knock yourself well, out, go yeah, for go it. Yeah, you've got, a, you've got a bargain there, which that's why I try and stick to RRP. I think that's a sensible approach because, I mean, the RRP is basically the yardstick. Yeah. You know, that's what the publisher says it should cost. If you can get it cheaper, brilliant. Well done, mate. You know, yeah. go go to Amazon, go to Chaos Cards, you know, go to an online retail and get it cheaper. But the RRP is the yardstick. It's what Fantasy Flight Games are expecting you to sell it for, aren't they? Hmm. And there's, Yeah, exactly. There's going to be a good chance that that's 
almost certainly the most you're going to pay for that game. Mm. Yes, yeah. exactly. So it's it's a worst case scenario. Yeah. As for as for publishers, you get the odd ones where you you get the positive feedback. Uh, I remember actually being in Aircon and someone randomly came up to me and go, Are "You Steve?" I'm like, "Yeah." He goes, "Oh, thank you for writing that review for me. You did me a solid there. It did the the game really well." It was the first and only time I've met that person in person. Um, but I've had a couple of special on Kickstarter games because one thing we haven't mentioned, I've always said that we do Kickstarter reviews. We don't do previews. Yeah. So, okay, we may only be reviewing it on Kickstarter prototype components and we may have only played it once or twice, which for a full game, we try and play it a few more times because of the time constraints. But I've always said we do a review. And the reason why we do a review is someone is asking to hand over money. Someone is asking you to hand over their money to go to a Kickstarter, which to me is is the same as buying it in a shop. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, you know, you're basically giving somebody an opinion of is it worth paying 30, 40, 50, 60 quid yeah. on this? Our priority is to give them a heads up. Yeah. Now, this is quite unusual. There's not many people out there that do negative reviews of Kickstarters. I do. We do. We do it all the time. <laughs> but But when we do it, we offer criticism, we, uh, constructive criticism as to how you could improve yes. it, and that's the crucial yes, bit. We have, Very much so, yes. However, we have had a number of publishers who have um, not taken... Ejected toys from trams? <laughs> yes. Mm. Yeah, I think... Um, we had a couple that said they didn't want us to publish the review, and I've held back two reviews because they cancelled the Kickstarter before I actually pressed the publish button. Um, there's a couple where right. we've gone, no, I'm sorry, I'm writing this review, and we published it. Um, I think the worst one, the most crushing one, was quite simply, well, this review doesn't help us at all. And therein lies, are you expecting a positive review will, because you've sent it to yeah. us? There's there's the whole integrity thing it's as we started It's integrity with. thing, but I don't know why, but I just found that sentence so crushing. It's the, it's the first time I've, I've had like feedback off a, a publisher for a review we've done and felt, ooh, was I too harsh? I don't know what it was. I just, I, I just inferred some tone from this. But I bet, oh. I bet we'd offered some uh, advice on no, what mechanics no, I, we didn't no, like that was, or that why it didn't No, that was a game work. all three of us hated. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I think I know the one you're talking about, actually. But <laughs> Yeah, you're right. There wasn't much redeeming about that, particularly <laughs> if it's the same one. There was one game I'd review that actually um, within, was it this year? I think it was this year that um, I didn't like. I'm not going to name it, um, but I sent, out of courtesy, sent a copy of the intended publication to the to the, uh, to the the designer, and they were less than enamoured. <laughs> but I mean, again, I'd, I'd offered actual, because I mean, this was a, this was a Kickstarter game, mm. so they actually had chance to improve it and take on board some suggestions. Because I'd, I'd offered, you know, well, actually, this this part of the game was a bit silly. It wasn't necessary, but if you put this on the back of the card, for example, you'd save yourself a load of money, and it would be a lot more obvious. Things like that, you know, to try and actually yeah. help them redesign their game. Um, but they, the, the the comment was, oh well, um, I have a feel. I, I didn't like it. You obviously didn't like it. I'd rather you didn't publish it, but I've got a feeling you're going to. <laughs> and he was and right. I did. The, bo- the bottom line for us, I think, is that when we get one of those and we don't like it, unless it's genuinely an abominable game and there's no saving it and it just needs to be burnt in fire <laughs> <laughs> you know there's a good chance that we we like playing games so if, if we can see that there's a good game lurking in there somewhere and it just needs to be teased out with you know that's it, some, exactly. a few little changes to the rules or a couple of adjustments to what bits of kit you get or it's, you know something along those lines then we're going to give those opinions because perfect to be perfectly honest if they released it and it had all that good stuff in We'd probably go and back it because it sounds like it would actually be a decent game mm, as a result. That's, that's really fair. But I mean, I, coming back to the end, what, respons- what responsibilities do we feel as a reviewer? It's not in our interest to allow people to release crap games. We don't want to play crap games. We want to play good games. Yeah. You know, to offer suggestions and improvements to publishers is surely a good thing for everybody. They get to publish a good game so they make money, and we get to play a good product at the end of it. Everyone wins. Yeah. Um, I mean, interestingly enough, the uh, Kickstarter in question I was talking about 
did really well until the day I released my <laughs> review, at which point it stalled and was cancelled three days later. I kind of feel bad for that, but at the same time, I think it's probably best for everyone concerned. That that other game that we all panned as well, um, it was quite interesting. I was watching the kick track. So if you go to kick track, you can see exactly uh, the stats of backing Kickstarters, you know, how many people have backed, how much money has been backed each day. And mm. um, yeah, that was very similar. We published the review and the amount of backers went into negative figures that day. <laughs> The thing is, I mean, we look at this and we, we've we've talked, I mean, you know, offline us about, you know, do we really have that much sway in the industry? You know, what can we do to get our numbers up and all this sort of stuff? And then you look at things like, like, like Jesus, did we do that? Do we <laughs> that even matter? Have been us. <laughs> <laughs> do we matter? That couldn't have oh, been crikey. us, surely. <laughs> That's just a coincidence. So, on the closing note of crushing Kickstarter dreams... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, correcting oh, Kickstarter yes. dreams. Well, I think that that's yeah. the ultimate shot of it. Why do we review games? Because... No, no, you were right the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Says, you know, Darth Sidious here. Yeah. I think the ultimate thing is we, as you just you touched on it there, we want to play great games. You know, I, I find our gaming time is precious. We said, you know, we've all got full-time jobs. We've got family responsibilities. So our gaming time is precious. So the whole point of a review in the end is to help everyone choose what game to spend their time on. Mm. And I'd actually say, I mean, I think I'm lucky to be in the position at the moment where the time is more important to me than the money, which I think is obviously the case with Andy as well by the amount of money he's throwing at Kickstarter. (laughs) (laughs) I haven't backed anything for a good few weeks now. Actually, no, that's not true. There's that magnetic one. Well, I'm probably going to drop that. Days. You haven't haven't backed anything in days, have you? Days. It's well, it's been, been at least 10 minutes, which for Andy is something of a record. It is, it's true. <laughs> if I had a Kickstarter turn up today, the which system works. Tortuga. It's all about pirates. Arr. Arr. Right then, I think we should draw this rambling waffle to a close. Yes. We should. Thank you very much, hopefully everyone, for listening. Yes, hopefully it's been informative. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for listening. I've been Steve. I've been Andy. And I've been John. I could. Would it be Would it be cool if we were different people? Like if I was If I was John, you wouldn't like it. No, you wouldn't be able to reach the top shelf. To reach the, the top shelf, would I? <laughs> oh, Jesus, that's the first thing you guys reach for, so to speak. <laughs> uh, I don't think you could handle the positivity. <laughs> no, do you know what? I couldn't. That would absolutely do my nuts. You're far too happy, Mister Cage. Oh God, you're right. I'm going to stick with being me. <laughs> you couldn't reach anything on the top shelf and you'd have to be happy. It would make you insanely grumpy and then you'd be back to being Andy. That's true, actually, yeah. <laughs> Universe See, has a way of balancing the... out. <laughs> yes, it really does. <laughs> there are checks and measures. <laughs> oh, God. Anyway, thank you for staying with us this long. I, I hope our discussion has been both informative and useful, though no doubt... Or at least not funny. At least funny, yeah. Um, don't forget, if you want to actually talk to us about any of these things or ask questions for future podcasts, we are on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we are on the Board Game Geek Guilds. Just type Polyhedron Collider into Google and um, we should be able to find us. We're actually on Indeed. Google as well, but nobody goes there anymore. No. no. <laughs> Even Google hides Google Plus now. That's <laughs> true, actually, yeah. Um, we're also at poly- polyhedroncollider.com. Yes. Which all these wonderful things are linked to. Yes, these amazing high high quality professional reviews that we somehow talk about. <laughs> so have a good time, folks. Tatty bye. Ta-ra! Catch you later. <laughs> <laughs>